today I'm so thrilled to have on the Women's Retail Collective podcast, Shelly Huff. Shelly is the Executive Vice President for Direct-to-Consumer for all of Serta and Simmons and the CEO of Tuft & Needle. Shelly, thanks for being here today. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so excited. Oh, I am too. I am too. Well, you have quite a dynamic background. I have to say when I was, you know, just getting some background for this podcast, it was like this woman's career totally makes sense to me. And she's done some really incredible things, but let's kind of start at the beginning. I'd love to find out like, you know, where you grew up and then kind of how you evolved into this, this retail career. Sure. Um, well, again, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to uh, to be here and talk through this today. Um, so I'm from Tucson, Arizona originally and okay. um, grew up in Arizona and I'm a fifth generation Arizonan and um, went to college at uh, University of Arizona. My first retail job was I, I couldn't wait to get a retail job. I've always loved retail. I've always loved clothes and fashion. And I think it was like, I can't even remember. It was either at Dillard's or Macy's. And I worked at okay. both at one point or another, but it was, um, in their ready to wear department. And, um, and I didn't think I was going to be a retailer then I was really into mathematics and my parents are, you know, academics. And, you know, so I took on a really serious subject matter when I first went to college, I think I was in mechanical engineering or something. Oh, wow. Okay. And I didn't think, and I thought, okay, so I'll do that and then I'll, I'll work retail and then figure out what my career is later. And what I loved about that job is that I would have women come into that department that didn't have a ton of fashion sense or they didn't have confidence in what they were choosing. And I could help them get, give them confidence in what they were buying and how they felt about themselves. And I almost saw that transformation happen every single time you had a customer come out in something she felt really good about herself in and um and then i got hooked it's like if you can if you can make someone's life better or their outlook yes. on themselves better that that was just amazing and so i ended up switching my major um university of arizona has one of the top three retail programs in the country it's called oh, retailing and consumer sciences hmm. um, i switched that. my major i know it's it's not many people do know that gotta give them um, a shout out more often apparently yeah well, and it's interesting because Terry Lundgren, obviously former CEO of Macy's, he graduated from University of Arizona too. So um, the school actually has the Terry J. Lundgren Center of Retail, and he okay. hosts a big retail conference there every year, which is really great. Um, but it's a fantastic program. And one of the great things about that program is the experiential learning aspect to it. Um, and so there was this group called Students in Free Enterprise that was a competitive student organization. And there's 2,500 schools, I think, that participate throughout the US. And, um, and so I joined that club. And basically, you do all this philanthropic work around free enterprise in your community. And then you present it in 24 minutes um, to, um, to ex essentially executives at the end of the year. And it's a competitive organization. And so our team made it quite far many years. And that is essentially what gave me exposure to Walmart executives and got to know that team. And, um, and essentially that ended up being my first job. But that's kind of how I got started in, in not really knowing that I would end up being a retailer, but ended up being a retailer. I love that story, Shelly, because I feel like, especially the students that we come across here in Minneapolis, um, it, they invest so much time into these programs. And I think more brands are starting to kind of get involved in, in those kinds of offerings or, or working with students and mentoring students in that position. And, um, and it's really cool to hear that that was kind of a launch pad for you for into this career in retail and, and then to, at Walmart. And what, what were you doing at Walmart when you started out? And how did that kind of translate into this role that you're currently in? So I started out as an hourly employee, as an intern. No way. Okay. So, in a store? Um, so I interned at the home office. Okay. I think I was paid like $10 an hour and sure. like lived with a bunch of other interns all summer and then decided to, um, you know, five weeks into my internship at Walmart, I was like, this is what I want to do. And everyone coming from the West Coast, everyone thought I was crazy. They're like, you're going to move to Arkansas. And I was <laughs> like, yeah, I'm moving to Arkansas. You know, all my other retail cohort was like going to LA or New York or all these different places. And what I loved about the company is 
you know, they gave you a real job day one. So, you know, you, I think my first job there was like managing an $80 million business in plant oh. food as a buyer trainee, you know? Okay. And, and so they gave you real work. The integrity of the executive team was second to none. People did what they said they were going to do. And the purpose of helping families save money is, is really something that I felt passionate about. And so um, so just loved it. So five weeks into my internship, I was like, this is what I want to do. And back then when I started at Walmart, you couldn't get a week of vacation until you worked there for a year. So then when I came back to University of Arizona for my senior year, I worked in a Walmart store so that when I graduated and started my job, I would have like a week off to come home for Christmas. Oh my so, gosh. <laughs> nice work. Way to go, yeah. Shelly. So for a year, I worked in a Walmart and I will tell you, I worked at a lot of different retailers and Working in a Walmart store is just a different experience because you never know what's going to happen. <laughs> I can only imagine. I feel like we could do an entire podcast just on that an one year. An entire podcast. Life. Yes. <laughs> Many podcasts. <laughs> oh my gosh. What off the top of your head, like what was one of the craziest things that you saw? Uh, well, mostly just things that like customers do some, some odd things sometimes and sure. that you have to cover. I think I, um, I was folding a rack of jeans once and realized that a customer had folded like raw steaks in the jeans like hours before. And then you have to, oh, you know, people play pranks in a Walmart store. And I'm saying this now and I'm like, I hope no one takes that idea and do does that. The poor Walmart associates, but, but yeah, you come across weird things in a Walmart. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Chris, Chris, my business partner tells, he worked at a Target once and there was a family that came in and started barbecuing in the outdoor patio set, like lit a charcoal fire. So I, <laughs> I'm sure we could go into an entire, an entire podcast alone on just crazy, crazy retail store stories. Um, well, let's talk about, you know, you moved on from that and then you went into the e-commerce business um, and into to hay needle, right? That was the yeah, yeah, I did evolution. Okay. Yeah. So I um so I spent a long time in merchandising, you know, obviously after my store experience, which I think was highly valuable because right. you learn a lot about the customers you're serving. And then um I essentially started my career at Walmart and um and continued to move up within the merchandising organization. And what was interesting is my last job in Walmart US was leading the kitchen and dine division um, for the continental US. And, um, and that was one of my most favorite teams I was ever on. It's just like, that's, that was just a magical team. And, um, and we ended up, we had, I think one of the highest percent increases were delivered to us that, that uh, we had to hit for the year in an industry that was kind of flat and not growing. Kitchen's not the sure. sexiest category you can ever be in, you know? <laughs> and so we had to figure out a way to grow the business and, um, and deliver our results. And so at that point, we had met the pioneer woman, um, Reed Drummond, and, um, and we decided to create a line with her. And so our product development team, and merchandising team partnered to create this line and it was walmart's first omni-channel brand launch in 2014 so we launched online first then launched in stores we sold out in three hours online we got a ton of ratings and reviews it drove demand in stores we grew, grew traffic to the category by 14 percent the industry for dinnerware actually grew that year because more people entered the category and it was just so much fun and she was so great to work with and what I realized at that point is how little I knew about e-commerce and how much I wanted to get into that business. I was just incredibly curious about it. And sure. so it was one of those moments in your career where you're like, I have the best job ever. Like no one would leave this job. It's just right. you know, a great team, so much fun, loved it. People were excited about what I was doing. And, um, it, but I knew that I needed to learn something different. And so when the position to lead um, home and apparel came available, um, I, um, I ended up taking that position, moving to California about four years ago, and about eight months later was when we acquired Jet and went on the journey with Mark Laurie um, to, to transform our e-commerce business. So it has been a ton of fun the last three years, and then I ended up... Um, you know, when, uh, when our former president of Hay Needle left the company, I was in the home vertical at that point and had talked to my, um, my leader about taking that on. Um, the company at that time, it was a really interesting time for Walmart and an interesting time for Hay Needle. Um, you know, I was doing it on an interim basis while we were looking for the next sure. president of Hay Needle. And 
you know, I saw the, where the culture was at the time and where the business was. And I really started to have fun and see the possibilities and realized I could make an impact there. So I actually asked to take that position on and I knew I would learn a ton about e-commerce leading a company. And, um, and we, we did make a lot of progress in that business. And, um, and so, um, at that point, we integrated Hay Needle into Walmart, and I had to make a decision on what I did next, which essentially brought me to my my latest venture and uh, with uh, Serta Simmons and mattresses. I mean, and mattresses. we talked about the sexy world of mattresses. It's a, it's an industry that's been going for <laughs> how many years? What did you? We were talking earlier before the show. You're like, I know somebody who's like a fourth or fifth generation mattress person. Like they yes. just. I work with Bob Hellyer, who's a fourth generation mattress person. And, um, and then I know nothing about mattresses. So I'm lucky to work with people who know a lot about mattresses. Um, but no, Serta Simmons is, is on a, on a tremendous journey, but yes, I agree with you. It's a lot different from probably where I came from. <laughs> well, I have to commend you because I think that you know, your career and just what you've explained, that evolution of, you know, really starting in stores and then moving to a full e-commerce position. Like, it was interesting to me to watch because it, it's like you almost follow, your career follows precisely kind of how shopping has evolved over the course of the last several years. And, and I commend you for looking for those opportunities where, yes, even if they weren't, you know, the most you know, safe or, you know, something that you were familiar with or that you really enjoyed, but that you, you took that leap and you wanted to learn more. And now here you are, um, you know, leading as the executive vice president and um, CEO of, of the Serta and Simmons and Tuft and Needle business. I, I would love to hear more from you about, you know, outside of the challenges of just learning how to grow those businesses, um, what personally have you taken um, from each of those positions that led to this one that's really helping you as you kind of figure out one personally how you're going to to grow in this role and then uh, professionally I would say how you're going to develop this this business that you have in front of you now yeah th that's a great question and something I think a lot about and um my passion for customers from that very first retail job has not changed I love customers. And I think my sense of empathy around people is probably what's driven me to take on more risks because I'm just more curious about different ways that we can help people. And, um, and this is interesting. So personally, I'm, I'm not very risk averse at all, but that's also because I have um, probably been smart and gotten great advice along the way that has given me enough confidence that I can take on risks and, um, and be fine with the outcome of those things. And so someone in, and I know this is kind of like a women, women in retail podcast, I'll say, say some of these things that, that folks told me is one great piece of advice that I got was, you know, save till it hurts, you know, when okay. you start working and, um, and having a good amount of savings for women gives you a lot of freedom in what you get to choose to do next. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, and I think that that's really important. The other is when I was climbing the ladder at Walmart, um, I had a female executive, um, say to me, she said, you know, you're going to wake up one day and be 50, make sure you've lived the life you've wanted to live, mm -hmm. not the life anyone else has wanted you to live. And so I've kind of had that in the back of my mind that like, your career is, um, yes, it's, it's Walmart's career, but it's also your career, right? Yeah. And what you want to do. And so leaving Walmart from a personal level, that's probably personally one of the toughest decisions I had to make and something I sought a lot of counsel on. And the other great piece of advice I got is always have a board of directors, a personal board of directors. Yes. And so, um, so I would say that, you know, I reached a point where I was more excited about what was happening outside than what I could do necessarily next or inside. And, um, and that I read two books and Kelly Thompson, who was the former chief merchant at Walmart e-commerce recommended these to me as, and she was an incredibly helpful advisor as I was going through my thought process and transition. And one of them is Designing Your Life, which is um, by Bill Burnett and Dave Evans. And it's the number one elective at Stanford. And basically it takes you through this process of ranking 
health, life, play, and work, and how satisfied you are in all of those areas. And it gets you to the point where you really understand what gives you energy and what doesn't. And then the other book that she recommended to me was called Reboot by Jerry Colonna. And it's really about the vulnerability it requires you to have to lead large teams through large amounts of change and that failure is inevitable. You're never going to be successful 100% of the time. And so I, I think about that, and you've been in retail a really long time too. When I first started my buying career, I had a senior vice president tell me, um, you know, I was a buyer trainee and he was talking to me about another senior buyer and he said, you know, she's been promoted so fast because she hasn't ever made a mistake. And then you transition that now to where we are with a digital business. And if you're not making mistakes, you are not learning anything and you're not you pushing hard not enough. Last. Yeah. And so it kind of takes you through this journey personally. Um, and I like the way you put it. It has been a journey probably along with the customer and where they're going, but the ability to make those personal choices and have your, your house in order to be able to make those choices and feel good about it. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and that goes back to just how you're balancing your life, what your values are, what you want to do next. And for me, I really value change. I really value learning. I really value curiosity and building and building out businesses and, and working with great people to get that done. So I hope that answers your question a little bit with the personal. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, talk about that too. Now, you know, this, this like increased risk and trying to figure out how to solve problems, knowing that you're going to fail. How do you, how do you take that on as you're approaching, you know, especially the D to C business for, for right. something that's as significant as a mattress purchase? I mean, that's a big, big purchase happens once, you know, every several years, hopefully you and I have both been in the mattress business too. <laughs> so we were talking about that earlier, like hopefully people are investing in themselves and their sleep quality so that they're getting a new mattress every, every eight years, seven or eight years, I think is the yeah. minimum, right? Yeah. Um, or the maximum I should say, but, um, what are you, what are you doing as you're kind of taking that consumer mindset, you're taking that, that increased, you know, test and learn approach as you're going after this direct to consumer business? Yeah. Well, I think that this is interesting. It's an interesting industry right now. And there's a lot of reasons that I joined this company, um, you know, from the team I'm joining to the leader, to, um, to the challenges that lay ahead. But ultimately, this industry has been one that, as you know, has been disrupted. I mean, I think over 25% of all mattresses now are in a box delivered to your door. And, um, right. and you were telling me a little bit about your legacy mattress experience earlier, yes. which I think is great. But, um, but so this, this industry has been disrupted. And the, the average price of a queen mattress, I think I read a statistic over the last four years, has gone from like $1,400 to like you know, $400. And right. so you look at this com price compression, the delivery has been disrupted. The engineering has been disrupted. The, uh, the innovation pipeline is, is probably faster than ever. And, um, and so it's an interesting place to come in and figure out what to chart next. And I think I'm fortunate to work with JT, who's one of the founders, um, who's still at Serta Simmons. And it's such a great story because, and if you go to toughtoneedle.com, you can kind of learn about why he created the company to begin with. But it goes back to this foundation where you and I were talking about earlier is customers have problems that that still need to be solved. Mm -hmm. And it's still not solved. I mean, we were talking earlier, I mean, people have a higher level of anxiety than ever. A lot of people were at a record unemployment rate. We're dealing with a virus. There were murder wasps earlier in the year. <laughs> we're dealing with a high, you know, um, you know, finally, uh, you know, racial injustice is at the forefront of our discussion. There's a, there's a lot um, that people are um, coping with right now in mm -hmm. society and sleep is one of those things that's an indication of how well are you doing? Um, right. And it's probably the number one determinant of how healthy you are. There was that book written last year. Um, I think Bill Gates recommended it, Why We Sleep, where it just talks about how important that is to your overall psyche, your productivity, and what you can deliver to the world. So, um, so there are still problems related to how people get information about sleep, how people are, um, what, what are best practices, how, how people um, can improve their lives and their families' lives. And so with that in mind, um, you know, you kind of enter a direct to consumer company with just a ton of opportunity to grow. And that's how I look at it and a, and a ton of opportunity to continue to innovate and connect with people. 
Um, it's a competitive industry for sure. Um, I'm lucky to work as, as part of Serta Simmons. I think they've made a commitment to really transform the company from a direct to consumer standpoint. They've launched you know, every single one of their brands this year has gone online. Um, so it's really just the beginning. Um, and I, you know, I look forward to, to continuing to work through a digital transformation with them and really bring customers back to the forefront of, of what we need to be talking about. So, um, so, so as you know, some of these categories, and, and we talked about it a little bit with the kitchen business that seems stagnant, there's always opportunity to, for creativity partnerships, innovation, and a way to connect with people that we haven't before. And so um, so I'm just beginning this journey. I think this is officially today, uh, two weeks that I'm with Serta Simmons. So, um, so I think that there's a lot more to, to come there for sure. Well, one thing that I love and I want to just like pause and reflect on for a moment that you said, Shelly, and that you've done throughout your career, whether you're selling apparel um, in a Macy's or Dillard's or you're selling mattresses now um, and direct to consumer with Tuft & Needle and Serta & Simmons is how you've managed to really find, even in a, in a retail career that I don't think, you know, people coming into retail are finding a hard time finding purpose in, in this kind of career. You've managed to find a way to really give this work your entire life a, a sense of purpose to, to really serve the customer. And that's something that, you know, I don't know if you have advice for people on how to kind of find that because retail careers, there's a lot of opportunity here, but how do you kind of challenge yourself in these roles to ask the question of how are you going to serve the consumer, but really so that it's giving you a professional purpose and a, a personal purpose for working for like those companies? Sure. I, I think, you know, for me, I, I, um, I think people are a motivator for me. And that's okay. just like, and so I, um, like I said before, I think, you know, and I, my parents instilled this value in me. My parents are incredibly generous in giving people. Um, and um, I, I'll tell you a, sh a, a short story. It also has a mattress involved that I think is kind of funny. Perfect. But, I love uh, it. But um, my mom had this home office and it had a day bed in it and, um, and her desk. And I remember coming home in college at one point and I said, where did the day bed go? And she goes, oh, I ran into a woman today who said her kids didn't have a bed. And they, and so I just told her to come pick it up. And she said, she said she left the kids at home because the kids were so excited to get their first bed. And she didn't want them to be like, you know, too overwhelming or, or too excited. So she came up and picked up that bed for both of her kids. And my, and my mom just like, was like, okay, we'll, we'll just like give a bed away. And um, and so my parents instilled this huge sense of just, you know, helping other people. And I think for me, that is my purpose. And I've been proud to help other people develop their career. That's a lot of the reason I get out of bed every day. Like when you're having a hard time finding a purpose, usually you can look at your team and it's like, I get out of bed every day for them. Mm -hmm. um, because we're all in it together. You're shoulder to shoulder with people trying to make a difference. And that has to do with career development and who your teams are to the customers you serve to um, the people in your life and being the best version of yourself for them. So what I would say to people, and I think that designing your life book is, is amazing because um, um, because if you don't know what your purpose is, that's a really good book to read to figure it out. Um, I was fortunate to find my purpose relatively early and really find energy around that and, and work for companies that I felt like really drove that home for me. Um, but I think that this is a great time for everyone to, to just take a step back and think about what impact they want to have. And I think, you know, now more than ever, we have time and awareness to stand back and say, what do you want to be known for and what impact do you want to make? And, um, it, and you know, what I found to be just a snowball effect is if you can invest in one person or one thing, it doesn't have to be, you don't have to be this big philanthropist where you give a hundred thousand dollars to whatever, like mentor one person, mm -hmm. mentor one college student go give one class presentation, volunteer to do one podcast, volunteer to do, you know, give $15 to your niece and nephew school, like whatever it is, like start small and invest in one person because that person will invest in many more people. And, um, and so I think this is a great time for everyone just to take a step back and say, what do you want to be known for? What do you want your impact to be? And, um, and for me, like I said, I think uh, people give me energy. And so that's my purpose. And that's why I do what I do. 
Well, you've already checked the box of my next couple of questions of what are your advice for people coming into the retail industry? I think this whole podcast, I feel like I have notes jotted down everywhere of how things that we could be thinking of as, as we're continuing our retail careers. But um, you mentioned Design Your Life and Reboot. Is there anything else that you are reading or are participating in or staying on top of on a, on a regular basis just to keep you curious about where um, retail as an industry is headed um, and then particularly you know, in your business of direct-to-consumer retail? Besides OmniTalk? Besides OmniTalk, <laughs> obviously, yeah. Um, no, I, I read a lot. Um, and, uh, so, uh, I, I follow a lot of different things. You know, I always, is an old adage. I always tell people, I'm like, well, I get all my news from the economist and us weekly, you know, it's like two really balanced points of view, but no, in all, in all sincerity, I, um, I read a lot. Um, Nick Thompson, I follow him on LinkedIn. He's the editor in chief of Wired. I think he has really good perspectives on, on what's going on. Obviously the wall street journal. And all. Um, I, I follow a lot of people on LinkedIn that are um, in really big marketing jobs, digital okay. marketing jobs, because, um, because they're really great at synthesizing what's happening and trends in the business. I also have been fortunate to just build a really good network of folks that, um, that I meet with regularly as I've been curious about learning about, you know, product and technology. There's like people I call on there or some women that I've met through different networking groups that are doing really cool things with machine learning. Or um, I get a lot of information from people and I'm very good at staying in touch. And I've always viewed that as my responsibility to stay in touch, not theirs. Um, and then, you know, reading a lot of books, I'm fortunate, um, to my partner, Brian, he's an avid reader. And so we often recommend things to each other. Um, and so, so a, a lot of inputs, the, uh, the other book that I think is relevant for people that are maybe, you know, digital transformation and a lot of folks are migrating companies now are migrating, uh, that are traditional brands into direct to consumer. There's really a different ways to lead based on the speed and the type of talent that you're leading. And I think one of the um, another great book I read uh, in the last year was uh, Multipliers by Liz Wiseman. And and what that book essentially talks about is the difference between uh, building empires and influencing large groups of people based on what has to happen for, for consumers. And so I would recommend that to executives that are leading teams that are now becoming more digitally focused. I think it's just a different way to think about things. And, um, and I think that that's a, that's a good list. I probably gave yeah. you a lot there, a little that's, bit babbling. I'm like, I no, think <laughs> it's, I, again, we have so many offshoots of podcasts that could come from this one podcast, Shelly. It's amazing. Well, it's to tie everything up, um, looking back at this career that you've had, um, the, the board of directors that you, you have, your personal board of directors that you rely on, if you could go back and write a thank you note to one person who you think has really made an impact on, on the career that you have today, the woman that you are today, who would you write that note to and what would you say to them? Oh, wow. Um, I'm sure everyone struggles with this because in order to have a retail career uh, lasting as long as this, a lot of people <laughs> help you along the way. So yeah. um, I would say one person I probably that knows he made an impact, but probably doesn't know how big is um, a person named Joe Bidoff. And he was my uh buyer when I was an assistant buyer. And that's really when I started to see what was possible. He showed me what was possible. And it wasn't because he was easy on me. He was actually one of the hardest bosses I ever had. Sure. But what he did differently than other people, one, and he probably wouldn't classify himself as this, maybe he would, but he's a feminist, right? He's just like, you can do, you know, right. anything you want to do. And what happened is, you know, he's, he kept moving up in the company as well. He's had a great career at Kmart and Walmart. He's retired now, but, um, but he left his door open for me anytime I wanted to, to stop by. And when you're learning how to be a merchant, how to be a buyer, and you're dealing with the complexity of inner office politics, or, you know, a supplier does something and, and you've never seen it before, or you're making really big decisions, it is so important to have somebody that you can just be completely open and honest with. And he gave me more time than anyone else in my career when I was starting out. And it was one of those things where he would be in the middle of a meeting with one of his buyers when I wasn't even part of his team. 
And if I was standing outside the door, he'd say, hold on one second. And I'll, he would give me five minutes. And those conversations that I was able to have with him helped shape me in um, how I led, how I was thinking about the business, what I was doing. And no matter what I did, um, he's always made time for me. And, and I probably haven't thanked him enough for that. And it was a different behavior than other people who are like, let's do a once a month mentor meeting and stop by for an hour and we'll chat. Um, whereas he really engaged there. And, uh, and I, I, I'm forever grateful for that. I definitely wouldn't be the leader I am today or have had the career trajectory I had had without him being that patient and, uh, and kind. Well, Shelly, I, I really appreciate your time to share your career story and your advice and your suggestions and, and just your, your experience. It's been so lovely to talk to you. And I thank you so much for, for taking the time and I wish you the best of luck in, in your career now, two weeks in and, and for here, here goes, I I'm really excited. And I'm sure all of our listeners are too, to just continue to watch where you're, you're going. So thank you well, so thank much. Thank you so much. I've enjoyed it and uh, best of luck to you as well. Thank you so much. Shelly, if you could pick three bands dead or alive, for your own Shelly Huff Lollapalooza <laughs> concert, who would they be? That's an awesome question. Um, I would go with Coldplay, Pearl Jam, and John Mayer. I love that lineup. Uh, so many people would, I think, be just swooning over that concert. Who would, who's the opener though? Who's the, or sorry, who's the opener and who's the headliner? How does that work out for you? I think Coldplay opens mm -hmm. and then Pearl Jam. And then John Mayer kind of closes it out. Winds him down. Gets Winds him, ready him to down. Yeah, that's the mood. <laughs> that's amazing. I love it.